And that narrative of Russian aggression towards Georgia is very, very important in also shaping the West's narrative about the current war in Ukraine. If the war in 2008 wasn't straightforward Russian aggression, if there was some agency on the Western and Georgian side, on Sakasvili side, then of course that might open up questions about the Ukraine conflict and uh, um, uh, and whether you know that actually is as straightforward a case of aggression as some people in the West want to say. So this is actually you know it, it, it's it, it's interesting, it's exciting what um, is being talked about in Georgia, but one should be under no illusions; it will not be welcomed in the West. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I have the very great pleasure of welcoming nobody less than Alexander Mercuries to this channel. And I'm joined by my co-host on all things Georgia, Lasha Kasratze. Uh, all of you, I suppose, you know uh, Alexander. He is uh, he's <laughs> one of the two great brains on the Duran channel, together, together with uh, Alex Christofferu. And Alexander also has his own channel under his own name, Alexander Mercuries. Uh, if you don't know him, please do check him out. He is uh, one of the best analysts, really the top of the top when it comes to um, European politics, Russia and the Ukraine war. He gives daily 90 minutes updates on the war, which is absolutely uh, uh, fantastic, uh, speaking to the camera, which I listen to basically on a daily basis. Uh, not kidding. Um, and then Lasha is a international relations analyst, uh, originally from Georgia, but uh, is based in the United States. And together we have a series on um, on the Georgian upcoming uh, elections. And that's what we want to talk about today with uh, Alexander. So both of you, welcome. Well, first thank of all, you. can I just say thank, thank you, Pascal, for your very kind words. And it is a joy and delight to be on this program with yourself and with Lasha. Very much appreciated. Yeah. And let's thank, you, Pascal, and thank you, Alexander, for uh, coming out. I know you're, you're very busy and I'll uh, really appreciate it if, uh, if you are curving out some time to talk all things Georgia. We do. And let's start right away because uh, we got news from Georgia uh, in the last couple of days. And, you know, the, the news cycle is getting faster. And Georgia is a country that's not that often in the news occasionally. And now it's getting faster in Politico and in these in these outlets. We've learned uh, four or five days ago that the unofficial leader of the Georgian Dream Party, the, the big brain uh, and muscle behind the current government, um, Bitsina Ivanishvili uh, suggested that maybe Georgia should apologize to South Ossetia for what happened in 2008. I mean, because we know that it was the Saakashvili government, the Georgian government, that fired the first shots over the border, killing uh, South Ossetians and uh, even a couple of Russian peacekeepers who were there at the time with uh, um, with a proper mandate. Uh, the uh, on the other hand, we've now learned uh, just a couple of hours ago that the EU apparently apparently uh, is thinking of suspending visa-free travel to the Schengen area for Georgians if the EU should deem that the upcoming elections in October are not democratic enough. Um, Alexander, what do you make out of this news? Well, the, the, let's, let's, let's deal with the second one first about this warning from the European Union, if it's happened. Of course... It's happened before the election has actually taken place. So um, doing it in that kind of way, and again, um, it, it's not something which we're you know, absolutely sure about, but it's consistent with the way the EU behaves. It, it, it's effectively a warning to Georgians, vote for the opposition, because if you don't vote for the opposition, um, we might say... Well, we've got concerns about the way in which the election was conducted and you will find that visa free travel to Europe, which is something which a lot of people in Georgia, I have no doubt, value greatly. Well, that might 
be taken away from you. So it's it's a signal to Georgians that they should vote a certain way. That is how I would see it. And given that we say we haven't had the election yet, given that we've got no reason at the moment, well, maybe we've got lots of reasons, but we haven't seen anything happen in the election, which would lead us to think that the decision that we're going to get is going to be a wrong one. It's an astonishing thing to, to say before the election happens. But the other thing, the other big story, that the one you've mentioned, which is the South Ossetia, the apology to South Ossetia. Now, I think this is actually, if, and again, it's a big if, if it happens, if the go current government is re-elected and we start moving in that direction towards a reconciliation between Georgia and South Ossetia, I think that will be very consequential because it will unblock potentially the major problems that we have in this area of the Southern Caucasus because we had the war in 2008. The war in 2008 made it very difficult for Georgia and South Ossetia to find a way forward. Georgia, of course, still considers South Ossetia to be part of Georgia. South Ossetia claims considers itself to be independent. Russia recognizes South Ossetia as independent. When Russia recognized South Ossetia as independent, there were concerns in Moscow that that might make it impossible in the long term to rebuild a relationship with Georgia itself. So you could argue that this step, if it happens, will start to move things towards a position where a general reconciliation might actually take place, where Georgia, South Ossetia, and of course, ultimately Russia, could find a more workable modus vivendi than we've seen up to now. So it's the kind of, I would say, sensible step that a government takes in that it needs to try and find some way to stabilize its relations with its near neighbors. But of course, it's going to be very controversial in Georgia. It's going to be very controversial in the West. Inevitably, it is going to be seen as a further sign that Georgia, if this current government is re-elected, re is tilting towards Moscow. Because the other problem is that everything about these elections in Georgia is perceived in the West specifically, but not just, I think, in the West, in geopolitical terms. So the Georgians might have all kinds of reasons for voting for one party or another. But as far as the world is concerned, it's all about Georgia's relationship with Russia, whether Georgia is making a pro-Russian turn or is going to stick with a pro-Western course and that is ultimately why the European Union is making the threats that it is and doesn't want to see the current government re-elected. And at this point, I, I need to add that uh, I, I agree with everything you're saying. Um, but And Lasha is actually affiliated to Sokumi State University, uh, which is a South Ossetian, originally South Ossetian university, although it moved to Tbilisi. And Georgia, uh, uh, sorry, um, Lasha. Uh, uh, can you maybe tell us a little bit about the mood inside of Georgia in, in also what you read about the the, the news of these, uh, uh, um, maybe an apology to South Ossetia? And um, maybe you can also tell us whether you think it's uh, it's reasonable to think that Georgia has other uh, has other in, uh, uh, um, uh, intentions than just moving toward Russia with such a step. Um, what do you think about this? Uh, sure. Uh, no, first of all, uh, thank you, Alexander. Yeah, absolutely. Your your the 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 picture you, and you just draw on based on your analysis is is what's happening. Uh, and so much for non interference and in, in in elections of a sovereign state, right? Uh, non interference and then so much for claiming that it has to be democratic. How can it be democratic if you are directly interfering and already try to influence the public opinion is beyond me. Uh, but Pascal, quick, uh, 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 quick correction I wanted to make. It's Abhazia University. Sorry. So they said, yeah, no worries. It's the Abhazia University that used to be in the Soviet Union um, in Abhazia. And now this is the branch in Tbilisi. 
Um, so, yes, the, there is there is big yet another risk that Georgia is facing. Uh, there is definitely uh, uh, a danger there for the United States to basically not recognize Washington for Washington not to recognize these elections. There is that risk, and if that happens, then we have to ask ourselves what is the next step. Uh, but let me just get back to this whole um, uh, apology thing. Um, it's it's a it's it's a it's a thing of pride in Georgia, um, of course. Uh, and if you look at it from the sort of a right wing uh, perspective, uh, uh, sort of neoconservative, neoliberal perspective, there is no need to apologize to South Ossetians. Um, and um, I wonder if, uh, although I mean, there is some truth to that. Uh, I don't want to. This is still uh, sort of campaign season, and you know, during the campaign politics, uh, all kinds of things can be said and should be expected, and this cannot be taken as a face value. Um, and I wonder if something like this could have been done behind the scenes with some, uh, um, uh, you know, some high class, high end diplomacy, high quality diplomacy, um, uh, you know, and some sort of a negotiation um, could have been made in this particular uh, uh, you know, aspect of the entire uh, conflict, um, sort of whether to, whether to, um, how to handle sort of a moral and ethical question of what happened. Um, but be that as it may, I think um, this is not a disaster by any, by any stretch. Uh, you know, this, you know, uh, it is quite plausible for any other state, you know, I'm sure there are examples of any other states of you know, expressing uh, on moral and ethical grounds, uh, you know, desire to to uh, to apologize for something they've done. Although I don't, I, you know, I, I I personally don't think that this is something that, um, you know, could be at the scale of say what Germany, you know, has done. And I don't want to want to put the two in the same category, obviously. But um, uh, you know, yeah, I, I can see how this could be very controversial. Uh, uh, politically speaking, uh, although it probably could be um, uh, handled behind the scenes with, with uh, uh, you know, with some smart uh, diplomacy. Um, but generally speaking, though, with the current situation in, in Georgia, we've seen we've seen uh, non uh, unending the whole the whole since the day one when GD won won the elections. Uh, uh, the entire sort of uh, Washington establishment and, and, and Brussels um, have tried to sort of baptize this victory, political victory, as immediately pro-Russian. There is a pro-Russian government that just came in. And even though in the beginning they were supporting uh, elections, uh, I mean, GD since 2012, uh, since it defeated the United National Movement, won every election. And it must be mentioned that Washington and Brussels have supported those elections, albeit controversially. Uh, but um, nevertheless, GD is the legitimate, you know, political power in Georgia. Um, so the question is, what now? Are we going to see a radical shift, um, uh, you know, in, in the West uh, uh, and, and to the point where they might not even recognize the government that they have been recognizing? And, um, and where does this put Russia? I always keep asking this. Where does Russia come in into this equation? And do we think that Russia will allow another possibility for a color revolution in the South Caucasus in Georgia um, if it really escalated to that level? Um, and so will Russia interfere, not necessarily you know, militarily, but... Uh, behind the scenes to save this government, quote unquote, if it if the situation escalated to the point where Washington just blatantly says, you know, we're not going to recognize the government. Um, so without complicating this hypothetical too much, uh, I think we should sort of tap into that possibility and think what what that picture, that scenario might entail. Um, moving yeah. forward. And and Alexander, like we have seen color revolutions all over the place. We have seen successful ones. Um, I mean, Ukraine was probably maybe the most dramatic one. It included 100 people who died. And we recently talked to Ivan Kachanovsky, 
the great Ukrainian Canadian scholar who who now has a whole book out on how this was an inside job of the pro Maidan forces, the ultra right wingers, uh, and you know this led to a, to a change of government, an unconstitutional one. Um, we've seen failed ones. I mean, I remember in 2021, there was in Kazakhstan, there was a moment <laughs> when something almost happened, the Russians went in and it was done and the West never talked about it again. <laughs> um, it, Georgia had a Rose Revolution back in 2003, you know, but it's a very fluid situation on whether this was real outside meddling or not. Do you do you believe that the... That, the the West or that certain forces, certain NGO linked mm. forces, are still trying to influence uh, the G Georgia's political way behind the scenes. I don't think there's any doubt about it. I'm sure they are. In fact, I should say that my brother visits Georgia quite regularly, and he's he's told me that as far as he's concerned, um, certainly in Tbilisi, um, which is of course the capital you can definitely see a certain attempt to try and mobilise um, a sort of colour revolution type, or at least anti-government sentiment in advance of the election. And basically to set a seat, the scene for challenging the election if, it, if the current government wins. Oh, there's a few things I'd like to say. First of all, GD has been in power in Georgia for 12 years. Now, uh, yeah. Lasha can perhaps... Can, tell me whether or not this is correct but this has been a very stable government in georgian terms since the collapse of the soviet union we've had a great deal of volatility in georgia and um then this government established itself in 2012 it's governed the country ever since it's provided a degree of stability and i think a certain amount of economic progress as well and i wonder whether most georgians who must have become accustomed and perhaps to some extent appreciative as in most georgians not all georgians <laughs> appreciative of that stability whether they're going to be particularly welcoming to attempts to try and change that um, through challenging elections and protests and returning to the kind of politics that we used to see before 2012. That, that's that's one thing I wanted to say. But the, 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 the attempt is going to be made, and we must always be clear, obviously, there are people outside, the, outside Georgia, in the West, who want to see these things happen. But there are people in Georgia who want them to happen as well. They will have grievances. Some of these grievances are real. People will be dissatisfied. There are undoubtedly things that are wrong in Georgia itself. The great problem with outside interference in a political situation in a country is that it makes the proper development of politics in that country extremely difficult because instead of people being able to come out and vote for parties that they support because they like their particular program and because they've got concerns about the current government, that everything is now shaped by this external tug of war that is being imposed on the country from outside. And I think that, again, given that the previous time when a colour revolution took place. It uh, it culminated in a, div in, in a disastrous war. I wonder whether that factor again is going to play to the support of the current government. It delivered stability. It's delivered a certain amount of economic prosperity. It's also delivered a certain degree of security and peace. And people may worry that they're not going to have that if there's another colour revolution all over again. No, Lasha, just, is that perception just right? Point. Yeah, just to that point, uh, if you recall, Pascal, that was when we actually did another recording while I was in Felicia. I stayed there for two months. That you, I, I just returned about you know, three weeks ago or so, less. Uh, what was the first point I made, if you recall, about how noticeable it was that there was stability and 
prior to my last visit, I, I was there before COVID, uh, and I did not get that sense. So there was a there was a quite significant um, a change, uh, and you know, to my surprise, uh, the way I, you know the way I was analyzing sort of the social reality around me on a daily basis people were calmer and the society was calmer and they had this sort of collective sense that no one was, no one was, no one was, that the, that the country was not constantly on the verge of some conflict, either internal, regional, uh, external conflict or some, or something that was being imposed upon them. And that feeling was absent and it was, you know, it was to my shock, it was uh, palpable. Uh, you know, you know, you could you could walk outside and you know stay out as late as you wanted, and you just felt that sort of feel of safety, um, and 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 people were just calmer. Obviously, now I will say this also: it still remains to be a poor country, and uh, there are plenty of problems. Uh, this is you know there are plenty of problems, even though there has been uh, growth in the economy. And I'm not an economist, but. Um, there is a, uh, you know, uh, uh, there are some facts to support it, and the agriculture industry, this uh, famous or infamous agriculture industry, that uh, the previous government sort of turned it into this uh, neoliberal economic um, uh, sort of a defect. Uh, it made it out to be that uh, Georgia was not supposed to be this agricultural country and was supposed to be industrialized. And you heard things, you know, from, um, you know, uh, you know. You know, Mr. Friedman, um, uh, Milton Friedman's philosophy on economics, uh, to Margaret Thatcher, to having a small statue built for Ronald Reagan. So you had this this neoliberal economic religion sort of imported into Georgia and spread all throughout the society, where everything was being sold off, all these economic strategic economic assets that Georgia had, back to Russia to the chagrin and shock of even folks in Washington. Um, uh, and it was all done under the under the banner of, you know, look, we're privatizing everything and why should there be a government of a bureaucracy? Um, and so libertarianism was the big word and Ayn Rand was, you know, advocated in every, every you know, facet of educational system. Uh, so, you know, it was basically madness. It was, uh, I, I don't even want to call it shock therapy. I don't know what it was. It was just a blatant or a great attempt to brainwash it, to reinvent the new Georgian, really. Uh, and today, this government, um, you know, needs to get credit where it deserves some credit because they managed um, to inherit Saakashvili's Georgia. And I always mention this, Saakashvili's regime did implement some serious reforms, some much needed reforms. But then after, say, 2005, six, it really lost its head. And uh, it just basically turned the country into its own personal torture dungeon uh, while being called, you know, the beacon of liberty. We all recall Bush's visit in Tbilisi, uh, I think it was 2005. And there I, I, I constantly sort of, uh, you know, pay, uh, remember what he said when he compared the shift, you know, the winds of freedom that were bl blowing out of Iraq <laughs> to Georgia. So the whole obsession with Iraq sort of had to obviously, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of be justified. Uh, and this justification was 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 Georgia. Um, and everything that Saakashvili did um, the good, the bad, and the ugly was presented uh, basically in Washington, and it stopped in within the state walls of the State Department, never reaching, uh, never reaching the White House, uh, because you know George W. Bush despised Putin, and uh, Misha, as he, as he was known, uh, was his golden boy basically. Uh, and there is plenty of literature about this now that actually proves this dynamic of their relationship. Um, and it's openly being discussed and available. And, uh, and so that's how basically Saakashvili's regime lasted between, you know, from 2003 till 2012. Um, and what we are seeing now um, is basically decoupling uh, of regional realities from that whole, you know, rhetoric uh, and propaganda and narratives um, that have basically been shaped by neoconservative and neoliberal concert in Washington. It hasn't happened just in Georgia, but 
basically the entire world. But Georgia, uh, so so there was this whole decoupling that's happening where the reality is is rearing its ugly head, meaning Georgia has to sort of return back to the regional regional geopolitics and regional reality. There's just no other choice, really. Um, and I think behind this um, wave of uh, hysteria, I don't know what other word to use for it, um, that, that, you know, uh, you know, comes out of uh, Western capitals, uh, uh, there is not much to be, to depend on for, for Westerners, I think, for, for you know, folks in Washington, foreign policy, Washington, those who actually look at Georgia. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think this is a very peculiar situation where sort of the truth has come back. Georgia has to develop this sort of introspective foreign policy that focuses on its neighborhood just to survive as a state. Um, uh, and then we have this sort of um, obsessive, dogmatic, you know, narrative that talks about, you know, continuously about these values as if Georgia needs to be taught, you know, about there is some sort of a fundamental absence of Western values in Georgia and somehow by sort of shoving it down their throats, uh, they will make it a better society, which Georgians don't really need. Yeah. But um, so it's, it's this very illogical process in which, in my opinion, the West finds itself uh, in the region. And it was you who once said nobody needs to teach the Georgians how not to like the Russians because Georgia still has bad yeah. memories, right? And on the other hand, though, Alexander, you know, what we what we thoroughly understand by now, I believe, is that we need to, to differentiate between propaganda rhetoric and actual policy beliefs that elites hold, especially in the West, right? Um where do you see these policy goals? Because like framing Georgia and framing the recent um, uh, NGO laws as pro-Russian is really is really dumb in the context of Georgia. But do you think that the, po the people in charge of policy, especially in the EU, which is kind of the major trade partner and, and, and block there, do they believe this or is this just rhetoric to support the neocons US project of, you know, maybe opening a second front if everything goes right? This is, of course, an excellent question. My own personal view is that when it suits them, they believe it. And when it does, does. but at the same time, there is a profound cynicism, um, you know, there as well, in the sense that they do believe because it's very much their sort of general outlook that if somebody isn't with them completely, if Georgia isn't heading directly towards uh, what they would say is Europe. And of course, these people definitely do believe that being part of Europe, being in the West, is what everyone who isn't Russian should aspire to. So, I mean, they, I mean, they, they sincerely believe that that is in the interests of Georgia and of Georgians. Of course, they also consider it to be in their own interests, because they they have worked themselves into the belief that um, weakening Russia somehow makes Europe stronger and better and all of this. So um, there is a cynicism because um, when they complain about the NGO law, they know perfectly well that um, what they really mean is that they want people from NGOs who are pro-Western to be able to organize and make protests in Georgia and to try and bend the politics of Georgia in a more pro in a pro-West in a more pro-Western direction. So there is this, there is this, if you like, geopolitical, cynical view. But there is the idealistic view as well, in the sense that this is somehow for the best and for the benefit of Georgia. So if we have uh, a color revolution that brings a pro-Western government to power, that is good. That is good for Georgia. It is somehow a proper expression of democracy, even if that particular government comes to power through a color revolution. And perhaps most Georgians don't um, agree with it or don't want to see it come. And your opposition 
to things like the NGO laws, which is, of course, something that you are applying yourself. We, we, we've got similar things in many Western countries. I mean, the United States, of course, has one. But, you know, the, the reason we oppose them, the reason that we see them as anti-democratic when they exist in Georgia is because, from our point of view, they pre prevent that tilt towards the West, which axiomatically is a tilt in favour of democracy. So it's, it's a complex sort of web of thinking. It's both a kind of sincere, sincere idealism, but with a cynicism there as well. It's If you meet these people, and I have done, by the way, I used to meet them quite regularly in the old days, uh, when my father used to go to the EU quite regularly. If you meet them, you realise that they're both very aware of what they're doing, but they're also they they also generally believe in the rightness in the rightness of what they do as well. It's the end justifies the means in kind of way. Yeah, which is why Georgia has to be careful that uh, the. You know, a pathway to hell isn't going to be uh, uh, pa uh, plastered with good intentions, right? Um, because Georgia already won spiral toward war, right? In 2008, yeah. this was a this was a, a, a defining moment. And maybe Lasha, is this 2008 war still an deciding an important factor in the electorate? for making up a decision, um, because we frame right now, um, and by we, I mean, especially, I mean, we in this program and also the, the, the entire West <laughs> frames it in geopolitical terms, as in this is going to be an election about Russia or Europe. But Georgians themselves, is international politics that big a factor in what's going to happen end of October? Uh, so on the global scale, international politics, uh, Georgia, Georgia has been uh, the sort of uh, the victim of the receiving uh, the receiving end of um, international politics, if that's what you mean. Uh, Georgia's uh, you know uh, interpretation of what the West thinks of Georgia has um, uh, has been sort of divided up between these warring parties. Uh, there is no objective analysis in Georgia of what the West. People are saying, well, look, Trump is going to win. We're going to become safe. The other ones are saying, you know, uh, you know, uh, Kamala Harris and the deep state behind Kamala, obviously, um, uh, will be a better option. So you can guess uh, to whom that group of people sort of belong and support. Um, but um, overall, I think what's happening in Georgia is unprecedented. If you take out the sort of political bickering, um, what's happening in Georgia is unprecedented because we wouldn't be able to talk about this 15, 20 years ago, and certainly not since the breakup of the Soviet Union when Georgia became independent. It was constant sort of uh, browbeating into pro-Western foreign policy, right? Well, with the change, with the return of multipolarity, let's not forget that, uh, and with this relative sort of decline, I don't say the decline, but relative uh, sort of, um, um, uh, you know, uh, stepping back of the United States uh, from that unipolar um, uh, moment and uni unipolarity, um, Georgia, yeah, was, was, I was pleasantly surprised to see how this current government sort of realized it immediately. And they saw that the global change in politics, sort of return of geopolitics, if you will, um, had also been translated and Georgia had to, had to have been you know, sort of adjusted uh, to that global change. And this is what we are seeing now. Um, so this raises a question again, what will Russia do in terms of this change in global politics in the region? Um, and where is, as a small country, you know, we, we know from the IR basic literature that Georgian can only either bandwagon or balance, uh, find some sort of a, uh, an original balance, um, uh, or what we offer basically from the Sukhumi State University, um, you know, that whole concept of South, South Caucasus as an as a, as a, um, independent collective space with Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Armenia sort of acting as in, inviters of regional powers to come, including the European Union and the United States, uh, it's the whole three plus three plus two concept that is being developed. 
um, to turn the country into sort of a, a geopolitical, of course, balancing space, but also to make money through geoeconomic uh, projects. So this is being discussed as we speak in Georgia, uh, in, 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 in Sohomi State University. So this, this new concepts, these new theoretical views are coming up. So all of this, why am I saying all this? All this, both from the intellectual uh, side, side, as well as from the political side, this is unprecedented. And as a Georgian, I can tell you that. Because, uh, you know, when I left the country, I was 15 years old. It was back in 1995. And I remember every single day, basically, how Georgia was being, you know, weaponized as a, first it was this great hope that here, you know, the Soviet Union broke up and Americans are coming to help us and save us. Uh, and the, so starting from academia to, to politics, uh, to, uh, you know, ordinary Georgian citizen, everybody thought that the West was coming to its rescue. Um, so, the, the, so that perspective is changing. And to those who don't understand the region might ignore the importance of it. But I think what, you know, if you, if you study the region, if you understand what Georgia is going through now, I think you realize you know, uh, how significant this change is, both collectively speaking, mentally, as well as politically and geopolitically speaking. Yeah, Georgia is now able to carve out that space. And, you know, I just call that neutral in an analytical sense when you join neither camp. But Alexander, like the big question in the room really is, what is Russia's position? And my observation is that Russia, as long as as uh, Georgia doesn't become a bulwark or like maybe a little a, a little dagger, uh, Russia would probably just leave it as a, alone, but w how do you see what the Russian what the Russian approach towards the development in the Caucasus is? What, what the Russians, if you're talking about official Moscow, you know the, the government, the officials there, what they want at the pre at the present moment in time in this part of the Southern Caucasus is peace and quiet. They do not want another crisis on their hands, on their yeah. borders. They certainly don't want a color revolution in in Georgia. They would absolutely not want to see Sakashvili or anybody associated with Sakashvili coming back into power. Bear in mind that Putin, at a personal level, dislikes Saakashvili intensely. I mean, there is a kind of personal animus as well. But they absolutely want to see a, a stable, peaceful situation. They are, I think, content with the situation that exists at the moment. And going back to the other question, if there was an attempted color revolution in Georgia, um, they would prefer that that never happened. They would not particularly want to become involved in Georgian domestic affairs because that's another distraction. They've got all kinds of things to worry about with the war in Ukraine and all of the rest. But if it happens... I think they will be there. I think they will be doing whatever they can to try to prevent that kind of regime coming back. Um, I, I cannot imagine they will send the army in or they will interfere directly or do anything of that kind. But they will provide advice to the government. They will provide intelligence to the government. They will do everything they possibly can at that kind of level, mostly to keep the situation stable, not to you know, drag Georgia into the Russian orbit. I, 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 I don't think that is a, a kind of priority with the authorities in Moscow at this time. Now, there is another dimension to this, which is one that I think people who are not familiar with Russia would probably find very difficult to understand, which is that Russians actually, collectively, do think about and do care about Georgia. It is very difficult for outsiders to understand what a profound influence Georgia has culturally in Russia. Um, as a person who came to Russia from the West, I was astounded by it. But um, Georgian influence at many levels, is very, very ubiquitous within Russian society. Um, it, it, it's also very entwined in their history. 
And, you know, going all the way back to the Napoleonic Wars, one of their leading generals, for example, who fought against Napoleon and who was at Borodino was a Georgian. And there's lots of other Georgians who are part of their history and they are aware of this. So it's a country that ordinary Russians do take an interest in. And they also, at a sort of emotional level, would not want it to drift away and be seek, become a hostile country to themselves. It, it, it would be like, you know, a, a rejection, if you like, of a culture that has influenced Russian culture in many very profound ways. I need to ask you a follow-up question and then right back to, to Lasha, but... Um... This war was is started in there was a war in 2008. It lasted five days and it has been over ever since 2008 mm-hmm. uh, for like, what is it now? 16 years, 17 years. Right. And um, why do you think that Russia didn't try to mend ties more because they they're still not on speaking terms, no diplomatic relations between the two? Um, why is it that Russia didn't try more to kind of show that, you know, give some goodies to the, to the Georgians in order to woo them over and also signal to the Ukrainians, look, this is what you could get. <laughs> I wonder, this is such a model case of how you could mend ties. Well, it, 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 it is, but it would have meant uh, making substantial concessions, I think, at that time over South Ossetia, which they were not prepared, the Russians were not prepared to do. And they had much more serious and complicated and important things to think about um, in the period that followed. If if we go back to that time, 2008, they just sorted out the situation in the northern Caucasus, where there would be this very long and difficult war against the jihadi forces there and the Chechens. Uh, are the Chechen separatists as well. So they had to do all of that. There was the major problems of the economy that followed the 2008 financial crisis that affected Russia very profoundly. Then there was, of course, the crisis in Ukraine. I, I, I think they just didn't have the time to think about Georgia in that kind of way. After 2012, when Saakashvili lost power and the situation started in Georgia to become more stable. I think they felt that better leave it alone. It's 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 calm, it's stable. We've got lots of other things to worry about. We don't have to worry about Georgia for the moment. And let's leave it at that. Uh, the, the, Moscow is a very different capital from Washington. In Washington, there's always lobbies and people who say, you know, we've got to interfere, we've got to be involved, we've got to send our people, we've got to come up with aid programs and do things like that. Moscow isn't like that. It's much more inward looking in a, in a kind of way. It doesn't have the apparatus and the machinery and the think tanks and the universities and all of that that you find in, in the West advocating policies for Georgia and policies for other places and um, trying to do those sort of things. So I I, I think, as I said, the Russians just had other things to think about, uh, relations with China, building up the BRICS, doing all of those sort of things. I just don't think they had the bandwidth to um, say to themselves, well, how are we going to solve the problem of Georgia What are we going to do about South Ossetia? What are we going to do about Abkhazia? How are we going to square this particular circle? They just weren't prepared to give it that kind of time and attention that the problem needed. And and how about Georgia, Lasha? I mean, how big is the appetite inside Georgian society to mend ties with Russia and to kind of, you know, uh, have a policy change towards South Ossetia? You know, or uh, what... What's the sentiment there? Does a majority want to continue the current way um, and have like basically no relations? Well, I wanna, yeah, this is this is very interesting. Uh, and this is why I disagree the way this whole cultural aspect has been politicized and weaponized. Um, I believe this, you know, deeply that 
If given a chance, Georgian society will be fine with Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and vice versa. As in, Latin fine Abkhazia, with them as what? Independent they, as they or will, as... Will be, they will be... There is no... There is no ethnocentric sort of uh, hatred uh, in Georgia against the Abkhazians or South Ossetians. This was a politically motivated, geopolitically motivated conflict. Um, and I think if you, uh, there has been an attempt as, as, as to turn this into some ethnic hatred, uh, you know, within the Caucasian peoples, in this case, Georgians, uh, you know, uh, Ossetians and Abkhazians, but um, I, I deeply believe this, and experts in Georgia also sort of join me in this, um, that if given an opportunity, both politically, culturally, um, there will be um, uh, an effort made to, um, to make amends. Um, because Abkhazia, and I'm not going to go into history here now, but South Ossetia and Abkhazia, they've been, and Georgia, have been historically together. Yes, there have been you know, um, uh, South Ossetia sort of moved in uh, uh, some, some, some time ago, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, they've gotten along through business, through trade, um, uh, through political uh, ties, uh, cultural ties, economic ties. Um, and so mostly I think the Georgian society uh, understands that this is a politically motivated uh, problem. Um, and it is... Uh, you know, I would say that it is politically motivated mainly because of geopolitical reasons, mainly because Russia, uh, it, just to go back in history here and just say, you know, 19th century, let's just say, you know, uh, has always felt the Tsarist Russia and then the Soviet Russia that the West was out there to get Russia. And there is evidence for to support this, uh, um, you know, starting from, uh, you know, its Western uh you know, periphery to down down to the Black Sea and then the Central and South Caucasus, uh, Central Asia, South Caucasus area, Black Sea area. This was this was always a vulnerable sort of under strategic underbelly of Russia. Um, it, just to mention a book uh, by um, um, uh, Professor Mamouli, uh, I cannot recall his um, uh, first name now. Um, I think he co-authored that book with a uh, with his colleague uh, from Japan. Um, and they talk about, it's an excellent book, they talk about um, how Japan, this remote Asian country, uh, was aligning with Georgians against the Tsarist Russia, and then, the, and then um, uh, you know, the Soviet Russia. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there has always been this dynamic where, uh, first, England, uh, you know, Great Britain, uh, which just never accepted Russia, uh, and... Um, and uh, the recent book that came out um, uh, on the Crimean War, um, can I recall the, uh, the author's name, also an excellent book, talks about how on a religious basis sort of the Latin Christianity hated, you know, Eastern Orthodox Christianity and considered them barbarians. And so there was, there was a voluminous literature that sort of, sort of talks about the both cultural dynamics, religious dynamics, and geopolitics um, of how the West basically wanted to uh, uh, keep Russia under its thumb, um, using specifically uh, these regions. Um, so uh, to, a, to a certain extent, this is repeating, uh, you know, sort of unfolding before our eyes. Uh, now using, you know, obviously Ukraine and then sort of trying to maintain its foothold in the South Caucasus, uh, the West is trying to do the same thing. Uh, you know, and then I don't want to get into sort of this whole Mackindarian, uh, you know, uh, geopolitics, but uh, I think it's at the core. We can we can perhaps do another show on that, but I think it's at the core of how to weaken and control Russia. Um, and they just have not succeeded. That's basically the fact. They just haven't been able to succeed. Russia, if anything, imploded as the Soviet Union broke down. Um, because of the elite sort of betrayals and so forth, not to not entirely obviously the West helped, but uh, um, you know uh, so. But um, you know now what's happening is is this weaponization of this proxies, you know, Ukraine, Georgia, and by the way, you know, Georgia we all know sort of very shrewdly avoided the same fate uh, that uh, Ukraine is going through now uh, has befallen upon Ukraine. Um, uh, although it came pretty close in 2008 that, you know, uh, 
to 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 basically um, being finished as a state. Um, and no one talks about this in the West anymore. But I'm I'm glad you know we're doing this uh, just to just to get some facts out there for for those who are interested in the region. Um, uh, but uh, to go back to your original uh, question, Pascal, yeah, I mean, I this is not something that is necessarily determined uh, that there has to be a conflict between Abkhazians and South Ossetians. And now with this pragmatic politics that uh, the GD is conducting, this is being sort of brought forth, uh, this whole point of the possibility that if you work with Moscow, there could be um, uh, reciprocity from Moscow where they will help Georgia uh, with, with South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Now, I have to be very careful here. Uh, it's probably help is probably not the right word, but um, the idea that some sort of a, 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 a you know, conversation can be started about legitimate territorial restore, restoration of Georgia's territorial integrity with Moscow, which is the irony, right? Surprise, surprise. It's not the West or Washington or Brussels. It's going back to Moscow, right? Which is, historically has always happened to Georgia. So now as a result of this pragmatic politics, there was a big question mark. Will this result in starting the conversation that could have started, many experts say, in the early 90s when these two separatist wars started? So it's, it's a very important dynamic there that involves both cultural aspects and, in my opinion, obviously, uh, the geopolitical aspect of it. If, Alexander, if Georgia managed to somehow, you know, signal to Russia, look, we're not going to join you, we maybe don't even restore relations with you, but we make sure that we don't become a bulwark against you, we, we, we become a geopolitical buffer, a neutral zone, do you think the Russians would actually then say, like, uh, I mean, would might be more inclined toward starting a reconciliation process? I, I think if Georgia actually went beyond that and said, we want a reconciliation process, I think the Russians would welcome it. Because, again, um, there is the cultural dimension that I did speak about. It, it would resonate with Russian society, the fact that, this connection with Georgia is being restored, and it is an important one. By the way, there are there is a very large Georgian diaspora in Russia, which uh, has uh, you know has a, its own um, you know influence within Russia as well, and we should not be underestimated. So I think the Russians would would be would welcome moves from uh, Georgia to um, you know seek some kind of reconciliation and some kind of stabilization of the situation in the southern caucasus i think that the russians would be very pleased with that if georgia did something slightly less than less than that and say well look we can't go full out for reconciliation because um, you know, we, there's still this unresolved issue of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, and there are other issues between us as well. But we are not going to align with the West. I think the Russians would live with that too. The problem with the last is that it's unstable. It's it's an invitation, if you like, to the West to actually come in and interfere. Because what they will say is, look, if Georgia isn't aligning itself with the West, with the Russians that that must mean that it's ripe for the picking. What we can do is we can sort of try and pull it back into our um, sphere of influence, which is basically what we've been seeing over the last couple of months. And then, of course, um, all the problems, all the tensions that we've been talking about will start all over again. Can I say just one, make one quick observation? If, of course, the Georgian government comes along and gives an apology to South Ossetia for the events of 2008, the Europeans and the Americans will not like that at all. And they will not like that for one very specific reason, which is, of course, that the 2008 war, or at least the interpretation, the, the, the narrative the West has about the 2008 war, which is that it was a war of aggression by Russia against Georgia. That narrative will have been challenged by a Georgian government itself 
And that narrative of Russian aggression towards Georgia is very, very important in also shaping the West's narrative about the current war in Ukraine. If the war in 2008 wasn't straightforward Russian aggression, if there was some agency on the Western and Georgian side, on Sakasvili side, then of course that might open up questions about the Ukraine conflict and uh, um, uh, and whether you know that actually is as straightforward a case of aggression as some people in the West want to say. So this is actually you know it, it, it's it, it's interesting, it's exciting what um, is being talked about in Georgia, but one should be under no illusions; it will not be welcomed in the West. <laughs> The, the depressing thing about the situation is that the facts are very clear. The EU commissioned a report written and directed by a Swiss diplomat, Heidi Tagliavini, yeah. who independently yeah. said, no, the first shot were fired by the Russian, uh, by the Georgian side. It was uh, Saakashvili who yeah. said, like, I'm going to take my chances. We know that this is clear. But the problem is the narrative doesn't care about the facts. So yeah. the question then becomes... Is the narrative an existential, an existential part of the security thinking of one side? Because if it is, then they will be willing to go to very long lengths to protect it, right? Um, and maybe again, uh, Alexander, and then we already need to go toward wrapping it up. But um, how far uh, do you think the, the West is willing to go to protect that narrative? They will go very far indeed, because uh, the narrative shapes their policy. And again, coming back to the earlier points that we were making, I mean, there is both cynicism and there is sincerity, um, both at one and the same time. The Italian Vini report, everybody in the EU knows about it. Everybody stops talking about it. It has been memory hold. People don't want to acknowledge that it exists. And the, the, the point is that you don't want the narrative that is this construct a fictitious construct in so many respects to be challenged in any part because when you create a fictitious construct if one part of it starts to collapse then it weakens the whole structure so it, it, it's from a western point of view almost a revolutionary act when a georgian government comes along and says well actually it wasn't the russians who were entirely to blame, our side, well, not our side, you know, the Saakashvili and people like that, they played a role as well. The, the West will not like that at all. They will be, they will feel threatened by it. And um, they will say the only reason why they are saying that in Georgia now is because they're, they've gone over completely to the side of the Russians. It's the Russians who have made them say that. So, as I said, it's, it's, these are very interesting times, important times for Georgia, and if you like, a declaration of independence for Georgia of another sort against the West and its narratives as well. I will ask you now both one minute final statements, first Lasha and then, <laughs> and then Alex, Alexander. Uh, yes, uh, that's, uh, that's right. Uh, so, such an accurate uh, description of uh, analysis of what's happening. I just simply add, this is basically, you know, as as dangerous of a situation as uh, GD is facing. If they if they stay principled uh, and politically they understand the game uh, and succeeding that game, they they may as well they may very well end up as as the country that basic as the government that basically shattered the myths that didn't really deliver much uh, for Georgia. There is still no industrialization uh, in Georgia. This whole uh, market-based neoliberal policies really produce not very much. The poverty still is still rampant. Um, uh, the government um, of Georgian dream is basically given what, what it inherited and what it has has done, what it basically can do uh, at this point, uh, even though there is still a lot to be done and there's made many mistakes along the way. Uh, but uh, overall, geopolitically and sort of in terms of um, starting the new chapter, 
um, they are uh, they are uh, at the head uh, of that process that has started and how they finish it is, is probably to a certain extent up to them if they if they're smart about it uh, and if they, if they conduct clever politics um, and they will end up as 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 being known uh, as the as the government that through stability uh, avoided wars uh, other you know another another uh, sort of a series of wars um, and at the same time managed to basically shatter this whole narrative that's been coming out of Washington for the past 30 years and it will have done so basically by saying that Georgia will remain pro-western country um, if you can just step back for a second and let us basically survive on our own we will basically take that headache away from you if you think about it, uh, which Washington always tries to sort of break through the break, break, you know, break through these open doors. And it really has really been contradicting itself to this point. And Georgian Dream can really say, look, there is no need for this. We are remaining to be pro-Western. We do not want the security uh, aspect, as uh, you know, uh, uh, to to emanate out of the South Caucasus and and come out out of Georgia against Russia. We need to, you know, basically stop the security um, threat as Russia views it uh, from Georgia. And if you help us with that, great. If not, we are going to basically survive within the region based on basic geopolitical principles. Uh, and if that happens, then I think uh, I think uh, they're going to have a bright future. Uh, it just they have to sort of overcome, uh, you know, this election uh, election period. Uh, and obviously, they have to work with West and, and with, with Brussels uh, and obviously with the region, regional neighbors. But I think they have that. This is the, this will be the first government to actually who will actually have the chance to accomplish that. Uh, and I think it will be very significant and a game changer. Um, the question that becomes has the West sort of dropped Georgia, dropped the ball in Georgia, and has the West really with its heavy handed approach um, uh, basically uh, failed to manage, uh, you know, the, the both domestic and, and regional politics vis-a-vis uh, -vis Georgia. Alexander, any final um, uh, remarks to that? I, I would absolutely. If all of these problems can be uh, unblocked so that we can actually have trade and commerce and business and uh, investments uh, from from Russia and from the other BRICs, then this could be an absolute turning point for Georgia. That there is no no doubt at all. And as I said, coming back to what I said, the, in Russia, people are interested in Georgia. It is an attractive place for them from all sorts of points of view. So Georgia, very ancient country, as any Greek knows, it's part of our history very, very much, going all the way back to antiquity. It's always shown incredible skill in managing its affairs in this very difficult and complex region, which is the Caucasus. It's always managed to do that. The best thing that can happen is to just leave them alone. <laughs> uh, we in the West, just leave them alone and they will sort it out and they will prosper. They have many, many good um, opportunities to do so. They uh, have every chance of doing that. I think that they are at that point now where they've acquired that level of stability. You know, things, as I understand it, in Georgia work better than they, than they used to do. Just let them work it out, work out their relationships in their region with the South Ossetians, with the Abhasians, with the Russians, with all the other nations of the Caucasus, uh, work with, you know, the BRIC states, the people in China and all of that, and Georgia's future could indeed be bright. And that would be good for the West, because ultimately, whatever game we think we're playing in the Caucasus, it's not going to um, benefit the Georgians and it's not going to benefit us because this is an area where we are not really in a strong position to project Western power in the way that we like to fantasize that we can do. Um, so we benefit from stability and prosperity in that part of the world just as much as the Russians, the Chinese and all the others do. And the Georgians, of course, benefit most of all. Very wise words. Peace and stability is good for people. <laughs>
who would have thought <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's just difficult to sell that to the to those who think that weapons are the way to peace but that's a discussion for another time uh, lasha kasaratze and alexander mercuries thank you very much for your time today thank you thank you thank you very much pascal